I don't even know what the question is other than to say like yeah. I've been on I've been in docks late at night, right? And that's rough and tumble work and it's rough and tumble people yeah. there. Um but to imagine that you would have to go talk to your boss through glass is yeah. it's, it's actually really jarring to me. Yeah, it's um I mean th- th- there's so many so many parts of kind of the truck driver lifestyle and how these individuals I think are are treated in the industry. That's that's a shame. This is the Vance Crow podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. This week's episode is with a guy that you've probably never even thought you would want to meet, which is the executive of a trucking company. And we had a fascinating conversation sitting around talking about how do things move all over the country? Why does it matter how truckers are being treated? What are the big infrastructure problems that are going on all over the country? I was so excited to sit down with Camden Civello, and I think you will enjoy this conversation. Before we head to that conversation, I did want to let you know that if you are in college and involved in Farm Bureau, there is going to be a very large uh, Collegiate Farm Bureau conference up at South Dakota State University, and it will be held on October 11th through 13th, and this is one of my uh, stops on my fall tour, um, which is coming right up. So I'm pretty excited about it. They invited me. This is their first time they've ever held a collegiate uh, conference. So they're they're uh, pulling out all the stops and trying to uh, make it really popular among uh, universities around the Midwest. So if you are in College Farm Bureau or if you have a student that you'd like to get involved in Farm Bureau in the future, Collegiate Farm Bureau has been time and time and time again a great place for people to learn skills, get lots of networking opportunities, and uh, and they've invited me to come talk. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about doing that. So hopefully we'll see you there between October 11th and 13th. If you want to find out more, I'll put some in the show notes. So without further ado, we're going to head on over to the interview with Camden Civello, the executive from the trucking company here in St. Louis, Missouri, called LTI. Camden Civello, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So the first time we met was in a uh, restaurant in St. Louis, Missouri, and we were sitting um, in this little booth with our wives, Mm -hmm. and uh, you told me that you were in trucking, and I was surprised by that because you do not look like a trucker. Sure. (laughs) Yeah, and I've gotten that before. And so um, so the the reason I had you in here was because Mm -hmm. trucking is everywhere and yet I know nothing at all about it so I thought that I would invite you in but maybe to start off yeah if you're not a long-haul truck driver yourself what is it that you do so I'm the executive vice president of a trucking company here in St. Louis it's called LTI trucking services Um, my responsibilities pertain to a couple different departments in the company one of those is our maintenance department. I've also worked quite a bit with our uh, safety and insurance group, driver recruiting, and uh, our uh, we have a couple business analysts as well. So that's kind of everything that comes across my desk. So shockingly, when we started, um, when we arranged this podcast and I put it out on Twitter and Reddit uh, to see like, hey, does anybody have any good questions about this? I get flooded with questions like sure. a lot. And um, one of the very first ones that that kept repeating uh, which I'd be really interested just starting off with right away is automation and trucking. Like, is it, sure. are we, are we just about ready to see truckers go off the road and, and, uh, driverless trucks everywhere? You know, I, I don't think it's going to be as quick as everyone thinks. I, I think it's, um, I think it's coming. I mean, eventually, I don't know what way it's going to, you know, manifest specifically. Where is it but, right now? Well, Probably the same level to where like cars are vehicles. So, you know, a lot of the technology that's in your car with cameras and sensors, that's that's in trucks as well. And that's kind of, I guess, like the foundation of the precursor that everything would be built off of. Um, You know, we you know, I I stay close with a few of the manufacturers like Freightliner and Volvo, and they're all actively working on it. And some companies have been test driving them, Um, not trucking companies, but manufacturers have been doing test test runs with trucks. So, I mean, it is, it's around the corner. Um, I don't think it's, you know, a year away or, or even three or four years away. I think it's going to be longer than that for a couple of reasons, but, um, I mean, it's going in that direction. I think. What do you think is what keeps it from being right now? 
I, you know, I, I think two things. Uh, the first is going to be um, just the general public. You know, people don't necessarily feel safe around trucks just to begin with. I mean, passing them on the highway can be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, stressful or, you know, a high stress situation trying to get in front of them. But, um, you know, I think people get uneasy if all of a sudden this, you know, truck is barreling down the highway, you know, at, you know, 65 miles an hour, um, you know, with a ton of weight behind it and a ton of power and there's no one behind the wheel. So, you know, does that make people feel safe? Um, you know, I think it should it, personally, I, I, I think it's, uh, it, you know, it'd be a step up for, you know, just general safety conditions and stuff like that, taking the human element out of it, out of the driver's seat. But, um, still in general, I think people get a little hesitant. So I think there's going to be like some, uh, big hang up with the public adopting, you know, the fact that, oh yeah, there's going to be no one behind that big rig barreling down the highway. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay being in my car next, next to them, trusting the technology. So I think that's one big hurdle. And, and interestingly, I think the other hurdle is, um, where the risk and like the, the insurance and liability is going to, is going to land. I think that's, that actually doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see kind of how that shakes out. Cause Cause, Meaning that, like, if somebody gets into an accident, who's, who's responsible? Is it the coder? Is it the video cam manufacturer? Exactly, exactly. And and right now, you know, uh, these these equipment manufacturers like Volvo or the people that develop the the engines, like Detroit Diesel and all these other companies, they they've been removed from from that liability. You know, for the most part, it falls on the trucking carrier. Um, the the liability is is sh- we're the ones who shoulder that, and. If all of a sudden you have an autonomous truck and it gets in an accident and, you know, people are going to start saying, well, how, how come, you know, this is written specific, the code's written a specific certain way. It's supposed to act in a certain way. Did that not happen and why? So when, once you find the break, well, who's liable, you know, for that? And I think that it's something that like all the equipment manufacturers are, are building autonomous technology because they don't want to be left in the dust. They're, they're doing it to kind of keep up with one another. No one wants us to get away from them. But I actually don't think they're overly enthusiastic of pushing it too hard because they they're, they're probably very concerned about, you know, having uh, just a tremendous amount of liability exposure all of a sudden that they didn't have a year ago or two years ago. It's interesting. I wouldn't have thought before you said this, uh, but how similar that is to agriculture. So yeah. um, in ag, certainly you could make the comparison that they have. Uh, GPS guided tractors, but mm-hmm. I think maybe the better comparison is uh, just drones in general, or or any kind of autonomous vehicle where there's no uh, person there. In addition to the liability question, you also then have it literally changes the nature of the business because now who is the farmer if mm-hmm. if they're not the person in the in the truck and in the trucking world if if you're not if it's not a truck driver it's a it's an autonomous vehicle then what is the role of a trucking company and actually maybe that's a good place to head in the conversation is what is the role of a trucking company what do you guys do yeah 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 that's a i mean that's a good question so um essentially uh you know all all, all these companies are making goods and products and they eventually need to get them out to the to the consumer so it's the trucking company's job to be able to um, have that portion of the uh, you know value chain or the process. Um, you know we take that on, so so that no one needs to be concerned about. Okay, well I built uh, you know this uh, this uh, product in Dallas, and you know I have consumers in St. Louis. Um, you know obviously we just we 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 take care of that we we deploy their goods for them on a on a large scale so we don't do one off things um like a, you know a FedEx or UPS would instead we're doing uh, full truckload stuff so we're going to distribution centers we're going to manufacturing facilities and we are filling up our trucks with um you know 40,000 pounds of cargo um it could be food products it could be electronics it could be anything and, you know, we are we are bringing it to a regional distribution center. And then from there, it, it'll be deployed out on a more kind of specific level. But in general, that um, handling the, the distance um, piece is what a trucking company does. So you you do a lot of moving things from one warehouse 
to another mm-hmm. and then it gets delivered on a smaller scale from from that second warehouse yeah yeah exactly so there's over the road trucking which is kind of that manufacturing center uh, to DC to distribution center or DC to DC so that's what over the road trucking does um, and then there's LTL trucking and LTL trucking um, are typically they're smaller um, trucks they're going to have the same trailer size but the truck itself is smaller because there's no sleeper berth in it those drivers typically get home every night and those drivers are the ones doing your um, kind of like you know uh, local deliveries so if a you know shipment of goods goes to a distribution center and then that needs to go out to a number of grocery stores they will go and and deliver to a couple different loading docks at a couple different grocery stores and that's what an ltl carrier does it stands for less than truck load um, because the entire trailer um, all that cargo might not be devoted to uh, one customer so there might be a few pallets that need to get dropped off at location a and then a couple more pallets are going to be dropped off at location b so that that's a part of the business I don't have a whole lot of knowledge in. We've never really done LTL, but uh, the over the road piece is kind of my more ex- expertise. But that's kind of the breakdown of how it of how it works. So your people are long haul truckers then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're over the road on on the road for thousands of miles at a time, weeks at a time, weeks at a time. Yeah. How do you find somebody that is willing to leave their their home and their family to go weeks at a time? it's incredibly hard to find truck drivers right now. So um, finding someone that's willing to do that is a, is a challenge. Now, it's kind of the status quo. So if you're in the industry, it's something you've come to expect. So if you're a truck driver and I ask you to be on the road for two weeks at a time, you're not gonna you're not gonna um, see that as odd or unusual. That's that's normal. you're used to that. Trying to make the case for someone to choose trucking as a career, um, that's where all of a sudden they're going to have hesitation and say, you want me on the road for how long? You know, I need to be away from home that long. Where, where am I sleeping? Where am I, where am I showering? Where am I getting my meals from? That that's where it gets more complicated. But if you're in the industry, it's something that that's normal. And so how are they, you know, where do they sleep? They sleep in their truck. I mean, you see those, they yeah. shower at truck stops. Like what's going on in a, in a two week span? Sure. So th- the way, the way a truck is, is, you know, in the front you have your normal controls, like what you'd have in a, you know, in a car, you know, your, your shifter, steering wheel, radio, AC, all that stuff. And then behind the driver's seat and behind the passenger seat is a sleeper berth. So, um, like all of our trucks have double bunks, but typically there's, there's one bunk, um, lower than, you know, like what we have, we have a, almost like a bunk bed style, secondary bunk on top. And it's, it's the size of a twin mattress that's back there. There's a few cabinets. Um, occasionally there's a space or a compartment for a refrigerator, like a college dorm fridge, something smaller like that. Um, and that's essentially the driver's living space. So I would say on, you know, in an average truck, it is you know, maybe, uh, six feet by nine feet is, is probably what it is there in the back of the sleeper. So it's, it's close quarters. I mean, it's, it's pretty confined, but, um, I mean, that's essentially where they're, where they're hanging out and where they're, where they're living when they're not behind the wheel of the truck. So that's inside the truck. They are obviously there's a network of fuel stops and rest areas that drivers utilize that's where they take showers. That's you know where they shop or get get food or get essentials on the road. Um, there you know there are uh, fuel providers that you know you, you fuel up your truck, and whenever you fuel up your truck, you know you get a, a coupon for a free shower, and that's what a lot of drivers do. So when they fuel up, they go in there. And these uh you know these facilities have shower areas. Is and, it like a locker room back there, or what is it? Is it nicer than that? Um, less nice it varies it varies um so you know some of them are nice clean pristine facilities and uh yeah but but it's it's like you know individual shower stalls and and you kind of run out and you know drivers it's kind of a tough gig i mean sometimes if uh it's peak hour of the day you know you might need to wait like an hour to get a shower i mean there might only be you know six showers available and when you go you know put your put your name in and uh the front desk literally calls you and says you know hey you're up it's it's time for you to go back there so it's a it's a very kind of unique and uh, interesting lifestyle and uh, you know r- regarding food i mean they're eating at you know um truck stops essentially so there's there's fast food locations there sometimes are kind of like larger restaurant sit down locations at a, at a rest area or they're just 
going to, you know, a grocery store or trying to go somewhere that they can get the truck in and park the truck in the trailer, go inside and get something to eat or get groceries and bring them back into their truck. I It would be so difficult to be driving for two weeks at a time, mm-hmm. having only access to like what's right off the interstate to eat yeah. healthy at all. Like uh, they must be having huge caloric meals and I, I, that's got to be really, really tough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's super hard to maintain a healthy lifestyle and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people just, just don't, you know, we, I mean, so many truck drivers are, are unhealthy and, and it's, I guess, easy to see how that happens. It's the, the infrastructure isn't in place. That's kind of conducive or encourages a healthy lifestyle. There's, there's a few people that have been, you know, uh, putting stuff out there online, trying to promote healthy lifestyles and trucking. And, you know, a few kind of, uh, uh, workout enthusiasts that are truck drivers. And oh, they, they post of course videos. there are. That's so, a great yeah, idea. There's kind of like a community out there that's, that's uh, being developed. And I think people have put out statistics. Like if you walk around the truck and trailer, I think it's 36 times maybe, or 37 times it's equivalent to a mile. So to kind of like, you know, gauge, if you want to like exercise a little bit, you can literally take a couple laps around the truck and get a sense of how, how far you went. Um, so yeah, there's some interesting stuff out there. Do you know any of the video, the, the makers of those videos off the top of your head? You know, I don't, not off the top of my head, unfortunately, but yeah, they're out there if you're able to YouTube and, and I know, uh, I think like two or three years ago, men's health actually did a segment on, um, healthy truck drivers. So that was a, a thing that was in the print magazine. And, uh, so when somebody comes in, that's new, how long does it take them to get adjusted to this lifestyle? Do you have a whole bunch of people that fall off within the first year? Yeah, if if they've never, if they've never driven a, a truck before, um, it could be a, a pretty long learning curve. Not just to get the mechanics of the job right, but just to get you know familiar and comfortable with the you know the living experience. So it's not an area that that we dabble in a ton because we. Um, you know, we have a fairly small training program. It's not a huge, Oh, you uh, train your own drivers. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, um, because of, because of a, a huge driver shortage. So we take people that don't have experience now they, they have a CDL. So they have, uh, they have the driver's license to be able to do it. And we will put them with a trainer for a couple of weeks. Typically it's a six week period. And, um, another driver, essentially a veteran driver who's, you know, that, that, that we trust and is qualified to provide some coaching will take this other driver out on the road with them for six weeks. And during that time, they typically, obviously they, they get to know how to do the job and, and what kind of trucking is all about, but it's also the, you know, man, can I do this? You know, can I, can I get comfortable with this lifestyle? And, um, I would say maybe 40% of the people, 30 to 40% of the people we bring into our training program end up withdrawing for that very reason. Just oh saying, my this isn't for me. Like, I didn't know what this was, what, what this entailed. And quite frankly, they say, you know, this is, this is too stressful or just too, too different of a, of a, you know, lifestyle. Can you pick out the sort of personality types that, that are successful in, in trucking? You know, there's like, there's just a tremendous amount of diversity in terms of like our driver population. I mean, uh, they, they're all so, so different, you know, and, the, and their backgrounds are so different. Um, in terms of like keys to success, you know, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, someone that can be a little bit, uh, you know, of a, of a coper, you know, I, I, I don't want them to like have to endure a, a terrible situation, but people that can kind of roll with it you know, so to speak, and, and, and kind of just like make do and not get hung up on any, uh, you know, uh, one roadblock. Those, those people are going to be uh, pretty, pretty successful. Um, now the, the drivers that have been with us the longest and, and are the most successful in the company, I mean, they, they are all about drive time. So you, you need to be like hungry to work because as opposed to, to maybe other industries in trucking, truck drivers get paid by the mile. So someone who is really ambitious to kind of rack up miles and say, keep me on the road, keep me busy, keep me, keep me, uh, you know, under loads. Um, those are the people that, that typically are the most serious about the, about their career and are the most successful in the role. And so what does that look like? How many hours a week are they working? Are they, they're going for a month at a time? Like if somebody really is grinding, Mm -hmm. what's the most they can do? Um, so it's, it's probably easiest to measure it on miles per week. So 
our average driver drives between 2,000 and 2,200 miles a week. That's that's kind of average work. Um, someone who is is really getting at it week after week after week is probably going to average upwards of 26, 2,700 miles. Anything beyond that is going to be pretty hard to achieve just because of the hours of service regulations. So drivers are regulated in how many hours they can drive in, in a day's period, in a week's period. And, um, you know, that, that that kind of puts some restraints on them because a lot of drivers that I know, if they had it their way, they would just go, 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 go. But for, you know, safety and compliance reasons, they can't. How long have those rules been around? Um, I've been in the industry for... Uh, all, I guess 10 years now. And they, I mean, they've been there since I've been around. So, you know, I think they've been there for some time. The, the big transition though was drivers logging their hours of working per day on paper logs, um, now transitioning to electronic logs. So that's in the last couple of years, that's now been mandated. So yeah, from the Twitter and mm-hmm. uh, Reddit comments, it does not appear as the trucking industry likes the EODs. They're called, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an electronic uh, onboard uh, recording device or something like that. Yeah, so that's essentially what an what an e log is an electronic log, and a lot of drivers don't like them because it's incredibly. Well, I mean, it's it's very precise and very specific. So the moment the the wheels turn on your truck, even if you drive, even if you drove ten feet. Your the computer in your in your truck's engine is is hardwired into your electronic logging device. So the moment you begin moving, it it uh, trips you into the to drive time, and and what that what that means is that that's when your hours of service clock starts for the day, and that that causes a lot of issues for drivers. And this is why there's so much pushback by drivers and by by companies is because a lot of times drivers and trucking companies get in really tight spots where let's say like, like here's, here's a great example. This happens all the time. Um, a driver pulls up to a loading dock to be, to be unloaded. So they, they arrive at a distribution center, they pull up to the loading dock and it could be three or four hours before they get unloaded and they might've arrived, let's say like two in the morning. So the driver's thinking, okay, well, I have a couple hours before they even touch my truck. They don't need to do anything with me. They're they're just going to go open up the trailer doors and start unloading. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to sleep or I'm going to start my break. And what they'll do is they'll they'll log themselves on break, and then if they get unloaded, let's say four hours later, someone's banging on the window of their truck saying, "Okay, we need you to move your truck now. I need another truck to be able to pull into the stock door." And the driver says, "Well, I'm I'm in my break right now, and if I start driving, it's going to interrupt the break and it's going to log me as is drive time. And even if they drive just a hundred feet to another parking spot, the the um, the electronic log." isn't going to, is going to treat it as, is drive time. So it completely throws, throws a major wrench in it and it's going to make the driver restart a, a, you know, a 10 hour break. It's going to completely mess up, you know, their, their hours of service and it's going to have repercussions for what loads now we can put them on. So it's a, it's a really unfortunate situation that we don't have a lot of control with and we still kind of struggle every day. So from a that planning seems like such an easy fix, like why, why is it that, that if it's such an obvious problem, they don't just say like, you know, well, there's a be, way to put in a, well, because I mean, I guess if you're getting, you know, specific about it, um, you know, the driver was in fact interrupted from their break. So, um, you know, the, the driver wasn't able to get alone time or rest, you know, they weren't able to get continuous sleep. So, uh, technically that driver was interrupted. So the brake should be, have to be reset. They, they just haven't figured out a way to, to kind of get around that or justifiably say, no, 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 you know, let, let the driver slide. Um, you know, so, uh, I used to work on a, I used to work on a ship and, uh, the, we, but in order to be able to work on that ship, you had to, uh, go to what they called sea school. And one day of sea school is, you know, learning what to happen if the ship capsizes, you know, mm-hmm. how are you going to get in the rescue boat? Another one is firefighter safety. Yeah. So, you know, you're seeing these things where it's like really big, important things. And then they spend one full day on sleep. And that one day of class, I, th- I think every human being should take a class on sleep because it taught me all these things about um, if you're going to take a nap, mm-hmm. it should only be for 30 minutes unless you can sleep for two hours. Because if not, you fall into REM sleep, and then if you're uh, waking up from that, 
then uh, then all of a sudden you're groggy. And then uh, if you can't sleep for if if you can sleep for two hours, then you better yeah. sleep for if you sleep more than two hours, then you better sleep the whole night. So, I mean, I can totally recognize the value of of wanting to have those rules in. But I, I can I mean, like of all the times I've ever asked for questions, the yeah. times that I got like people like having visceral anger um, in their questions was all around EOD of, of yeah. all the podcasts I've ever done. Sure. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, the thing is uh, with, with paper logs, drivers were, you know, essentially saying that that break never happened. That interruption never happened. I moved my truck, you know, from here to here, hundred feet away and they would not log like a break or an interruption like that because it was in their, it was in their best interest not to, you know, they, they were thinking, well, I want to, yeah, I want to, I'm paid by the mile. I want to, I want to get another load under me as soon as possible so I can get moving and get paid. And that's why so much, you know, like animosity is, a, is around the e-log system because it's uh, it's incredibly specific and it, and it's kind of restraining the company and the, and the driver. And then with these rules on how many hours a trucker can drive, mm-hmm. does that, that has to really be hard on a trucking company. If you're finding out like, Hey, we, we, we have trouble hiring people and we can't max out any more hours on these people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a truck can drive 10, <coughs> 10 to 11 hours a day or driver can drive 10 to 11 hours a day. And there's, um, you know, there's nuances that make it one or the other, but essentially they, that's how much drive time a driver can have legally in a day's time. Um, now, our trucks, for instance, are only averaging six and a half to seven hours of drive time a day. So there is, you know, three hours of like kind of capacity, like, you know, under utilization that a truck has. And that's that's really because of just the nature of of loads, appointment times and then the hours of service. So um, you kind of have to accept and go into things you know, anticipating that you're not going to be 100 percent efficient because of, you know, regulations or just the nature of, of loads and load planning. Um, so when you think about load planning, what is that like? Because you have you're, you're basically doing the traveling salesman. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago where sure. it's like, you know, you have a bunch of paths. You have to get to all of the cities. You don't want to pass through a city you're not, you know, mm-hmm. delivering something into. So what is the shortest route between these? Yeah, that's your world, right? Where you're scheduling drivers and saying, go to Kansas City and then you're going to drive to Dallas and then somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that's where like the logistics, you know, um, really, really begins to rear its head. Um, We have essentially, you know, we have a a number of customers and they have freight that they have committed to us that we've that we've bid on and we've won and, and it's secured for us Wait, to move you've bid on that so that's how you get jobs it's mm-hmm. not like hey we've got a relationship with this company and they want us to you, you, like how does that how does that happen All, almost really um i mean we have we have some really strong relationships with customers which which we're fortunate um on now because of that we we're considered incumbents on certain lanes so certain lanes aren't put out to bid they say hey you know you guys have done a, a great job on this lane good on time service your rates are competitive we're going to leave this on you and we have good relationships to make sure that, that happens as much as possible but really ever since the recession it's commonplace now for pretty much all major shippers to go through like an RFID bidding process where they put out their lanes out, out to hundreds of thousands of carriers. And you essentially say, Hey, I'd like to, I'd like this lane. I could do X number of loads on this lane a week or, or a what day. Is or a, lane? Uh, a lane is like just point A to point B. So St. Louis to Chicago or Chicago to Dallas. That's, that's a lane. Okay. Um, and you know, I guess, I guess, I guess kind of getting back to your question of, of planning and what you need to kind of think about is you have all these customers that you've entered into agreements with to handle their cargo and you have drivers. You, so you have a terminal, which ours is here in St. Louis. You have drivers, their, their home location. So where they want to get through home and stuff like that. And, and you, you have kind of this network, um, so, so to speak, where you need to be able to plan, okay, I need to get this truck from here, from point A to point B. And then from B, I'm going to get them unloaded, reloaded, unload, going to C. Um, after C, they're going to be close to home. It'll be about two weeks into their, their trips. So I'm going to let them swing by home for a couple days, and then I'm going to get them back on the road. Then I'm going to get them a load out of their hometown area up to this place. And all that needs to, to match the 
the volume commitments that you've given to your customer. It needs to, um, you know, match the seasonality of the business. So some customers, uh, you know, freight shoots up during some months and dips down on other months. So you need to take that into factor. And then this is kind of what we were talking about the other day. Another big uh, part of it is the balance. So um, you need to accept freight and, and plan loads based off of how many inbound loads and outbound loads you have out of a certain market area. So I can't send, I, I, I just can't automatically accept 10 loads going from St. Louis to Denver unless I know that I have 10 good options coming out of Denver. So that's kind of where the balance uh, factor comes in. Comes because if play. you don't, then you're sending a truck empty somewhere mm-hmm. else and you're footing the bill for all the fuel and the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, in the trucking industry, that's called deadhead is, is when you have to drive a truck empty to go pick up another load and it averages about 11 percent of our total miles or deadhead miles um and so how how do you solve this problem then i mean like of logistics how do you how do you possibly manage all of this is it is it it five people in a room penciling it out or i i mean yeah we have we have a whole team of customer service reps who are the ones taking loads from customers And then they, in turn, are feeding that information to load planners. Load planners are looking at what customer commitments have been made in what market areas and making sure that we have the right number of inbound, outbound trucks in each area to be able to service all of those loads. And then you have fleet managers, which essentially dispatch the driver to the load, give them the instructions, make sure that they get from point A to point B as planned. Um, There's a lot of software involved that kind of helps that. So software that is... Um, helping you see all the options and helping you kind of manage your network of trucks. Um, You know, when you have 300 trucks and and you're doing, you know, 900 loads a week, you know, it, it, it's just outside of the human capacity to be able to analyze every option yourself. So the software is doing that, doing that for us. It's load optimization software. It is, uh, there, there's profitability softwares out there that we use um, trying to help us say, well, I'm going to put more emphasis on these loads because they feed me into this market area, which pays more coming out, which works well with this customer that we have and we get good rates from. It, it, it puts all those factors um, you know, into consideration. And then our, we also have dispatch software, which makes sure that the load optimization options that we have matches with the the driver schedules we have and the driver hours that we have and the driver events that we have you know drivers need to get home for weddings and doctor's appointments and stuff like that so that all needs to be factored in the planning it's not just a matter of planning loads it's planning all those factors and making sure that they can do it all legally as well and the the computers do they go as far as as being like flipping you a flag to say hey this guy hasn't been home in in a couple of weeks and we want to make sure he has time with his family or is that so so all the all the software is uh set up to be able to create a driver profile so every one of our drivers has a set of preferences they have they have a home time so we have a home address on system for each one of our drivers sometimes our drivers um they they like taking home time somewhere else maybe another family member so we have that put in the system and uh, we have some drivers who don't have homes. They literally live in the truck. They have no home address. They are just saying, just keep me rolling. And when I want to take a break for a couple of days, I'll just park the truck and sit in the back and hang out for a couple of days. Um, and then are there a lot of people like that? Um, not, not a ton, but it's, it's out there. I mean, I would say we probably have, I mean, out of 300 drivers, I bet you 10 of them, okay. you know, I, I could probably come up with 10 names of individuals I know just live in their truck. I have some drivers who live in Alaska, believe it or not. And, you know, we don't we don't haul loads up to Alaska. But the arrangement is, is that, you know, this driver works for six months at a time and then they'll park the truck at the terminal, fly home, be home for two, three, four weeks. And then they'll fly back, get back in their truck and get back to work. It's just it's different for everyone. Um, So those, uh, you know, regarding those driver profiles, we also have their preferences set up. So this driver uh, really wants to be home on the weekends, you know, can we accommodate that with where they live? The software kind of helps us, uh, be able to do that. And we have some drivers that say, Hey, I like being on the road six weeks at a time. And then I like being home for one week. We'll plug that into the software too. So we're able to kind of incorporate those preferences. And what allows you to be competitive to get drivers to come work for you versus some other company? Well, it's, 
you know, it's really hard and, uh, you know, it's something that we haven't, you know, quite frankly, we haven't mastered. I don't know if there are many companies out there that have turnover is almost inevitable. Um, I, gosh, I think the last time I checked industry statistics, I think the industry turnover is 92%. So 92% of your fleet is, is having to be rehired every, every year, every year, 92%. Every year. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll probably hire 285 drivers or something like that this year. Your HR department must be enormous. Yeah. I mean, we have a full-time driver recruiting department. So we, we are hiring, we, we have full-time recruiters that are putting ads out there, talking to prospective drivers, lining them up for orientation. We have orientation to onboard new drivers every single week. So that, that never stops. Um, well, we'll bring on orientation classes of, you know, five to six drivers and get them in a truck. And that's, that's really just to, uh, um, just to, to, to make sure that, that your fleet isn't shrinking, you know, that's just keeping up with what you've, with what you've lost. So, I think, I mean, with that said, I don't think it's just, uh, you can't just write it off and say, well, turnover is inevitable. So there's nothing you can do from a workforce management standpoint. I think there are things, um, you know, the, the companies that are the best for the, for the driver, you know, are the ones that can kind of, you know, um, I guess honor the, the agreement that was made. So if a driver says, Hey, I'd like to be out on the road for 12 days, home every, you know, home for two days. If, if, if a company can kind of hold up their end of the agreement on that, then drivers like that. If a recruiter promises drivers, Hey, you know, on average, you're going to be driving 2,200 miles a week, or you're going to be paid at a pay rate of 50 cents a mile. Drivers kind of, you know, banking on that money. It's not a consistent paycheck. So the ones who can actually, again, kind of hold up their end of the deal and get those driver, get that driver, those miles each week um, are going to be the ones that are going to be better for the driver. And that's going to lead to their kind of retention and then, and then some creature comforts, you know, so they're, you know, a, a lot of trucking companies don't let them have pets in the truck. You know, we, we do. Huh. So, so we let drivers bring dogs along. Are they your trucks? Along. Yeah. And then, so then you say, <laughs> if you have a dog, you're welcome to. Yeah. 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 I mean, we try to, uh, you know, we try to put some guidelines to it, you know, size of the, of the dog and things like that. But it, to be quite honest, it still kind of gets away from us. You know, we'll, we'll give someone a thumbs up and say, yeah, you know, you can bring on, you bring in your dog, you know, what kind of dog is it? Oh, it's, a, you know, how big is it? Oh, it's, and then all of a sudden we see a German shepherd and the dog <laughs> like a week later and, you know, I think we, we try to kind of pick our battles. If, if a driver is caring for the equipment, well, keeping their, their inside of the truck relatively neat and tidy, the, the dog's not like chewing up the seats or something like that, you know, we will, we'll let it slide just because we understand that they're, they're making a ton of sacrifice away from, you know, loved ones and friends and family. That would make such a huge difference. So it's a game changer. Dog. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a total game changer. And, you know, right now we say dogs and cats, but I mean, I, I, we had one driver who, uh, he had a parrot with him, literally a talking parrot. So he was driving down the road and he had a parrot up on his shoulder and, you know, I guess it knew a few phrases and, and it would just be like talking to him as he's going down the road. And like, you know, that's, that's what it took for that driver. You know I mean? That's what he liked. That was his, that was part of the deal. And, you know, we were able to accommodate it. And you guys are pretty rare for having uh, pets in the truck. Surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. So we benchmarked ourselves against a few other a few other trucking companies and, um, it's not as common just because it, it just creates a hassle, you know, when you have all these pets in the truck, um, th- there's not real good evidence for it being like a safety concern. You know, if anything, it probably makes for a more like comfortable, like stress reduced driver. Um, but just from like a cleaning standpoint, because, you know, we like to s- think that it improves turnover, but still inevitably we're going to have some turnover. So just cleaning a truck and getting it ready for the next driver, you know, and a, a driver coming out from orientation saying, Hey, I've, you know, I have allergies, you know, and there's pet dander in this truck or, you know, uh, you guys weren't able to get all the, the dog hair off the, the passenger seat, you know, stuff like that. It, it just makes it to where, I mean, we have, a, we have two people who their entire job is just detailing trucks Oh, really? the, the entire, yeah, every single day they're just cleaning trucks, getting it ready. So, you know, those, those are the things we have to do in exchange for allowing drivers to, to have pets. So you have 300 trucks. Mm-hmm. Are they pretty nice? Are they new? Like what, what is going on? Like, how do you choose what truck to put a driver in? Yeah. Uh, trucks are, so our average fleet age is about three years old. Um, Your trucks only are three years old, only three years old. Yeah. And to be honest, that's, that's even a little bit older than what it is at a lot of other trucking companies, like big trucking companies. I mean, smaller mom and pop ones, 
there's no way that you can make this that business work. model sounds insane to me. You have 92% yeah. turnover <laughs> and you have to change 300 trucks out every three years. I mean, the capital expense on that alone seems unbearable. Well, n- not change out every three years. So like we're on a five year trade cycle. Okay. So at this point in time, our trucks are about three years old. I see. Um, but a lot of, a lot of companies do what you were just saying, Even you know, that, they're, they're swapping equipment years, yeah. out, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a financial calculation, I guess, you know, they're, they're looking at the debt payments on the truck and, and they're depreciating it at a certain rate. They're keeping their eye on the resale marketplace for these, for these trucks three years later. And, um, you know, they just, they, they just kind of plan for it. you know, I mean, their, their fuel economy benefits, there are maintenance benefits to having newer equipment. And if, you know, people are looking at the numbers, they can make the case where financially this is going to be better as opposed to me holding on to a truck for five or six or seven years. And, you know, again, it all kind of depends to what's happening in the secondary marketplace. So, um, right now the used truck market is not, is not good. It's flooded with inventory. Um, but you know, uh, what that kind of means is, oh, I might hang on my equipment a little bit longer. I don't want to trade it right now. Or you're, you're looking for buyers in, in Central America or Mexico that want to, that want these trucks. I mean, <laughs> there, there are all sorts of creative options that trucking companies sometimes need to, to try to figure out in order to be able to have a trade schedule. But going back to your, uh, you know, kind of to your, to your question, I mean, it is an insane model too, because the uh, the equipment is so expensive. So uh, trucks are upwards of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars for just the truck itself nowadays. Um, and that's a semi, right? Like yeah, a- that's that's a semi truck. Now that's not the trailer. That's just the truck. Uh, the trailer itself, we do all refrigerated freight. So um, we we have refrigeration units on the on the trailer. Um, trailers are uh, more than sixty thousand dollars. Oh wow! Yeah. So it, they don't look it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's just a, it looks like a box. Right. Um, so what's really remarkable is we are, we are, like I said, we're hiring five, six drivers every single week. I, you know, we've done some basic due diligence. We've checked their background records. You know, we feel them out in orientation, make sure that, you know, this is someone we feel comfortable with, but really we, you know, we just don't know. And, and we're taking a driver that we've, we've known for two or three days and we're handing them the keys to, you know, uh, over $200,000 yeah. Yeah, of, of equipment, not to mention the cargo, you know, cargo on average, I mean, could be worth $50,000. It could be, if it's high dollar cargo, it could be $200,000 of, of cargo. And you're just, you're given the keys to this driver that you've never met and don't really know. And who knows, might only be with you for a month or two or three months. And you're just kind of saying, okay, well, there you go. Uh, here's your first load. So it's, um, it's very, it's very strange. It's, I mean, I, it's the only industry I've ever worked in, um, really. So I don't know it any differently, but I'm sure it's not the way it works, you know, in other, other, other fields. So you, uh, you know, is full disclosure, both of our wives are physical therapists and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and quite good actually. Uh, but I would imagine that the seat that a truck driver sits down in all day long, uh, has got to have a big impact on how long they want to be on the road or how long they even can be on the road. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the seats are nice, you know, I mean, they're called like air ride seats and, and they spring up and down to take out any sort of vibration or any sort of bump. It, it keeps the driver level and you know, they're, they're pretty expensive. I think to swap out a seat is, is pretty much, I think, I think a thousand dollars to take it to swap out a driver's seat. So it's expensive and it works, but I mean, still, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do it, you know, to, to sit at, at the driver's seat for seven hours a day, maybe, maybe more, um, for weeks at a time. It's, it would, it would be tough. And what do you think, like, do you have a sense for what people do to keep themselves alert and awake or podcasts? I mean, I actually know cause there are podcasts out there cause I looked them up and they're, yeah. they're pretty fun. And, uh, and I was listening to some of the issues that they bring up, but what, what are they doing? I mean, <sighs> A lot of the drivers that, that I know are pretty techy. So they, you know, they're, they're active on social media. They, they do a lot of messaging and, you know, they're, they're doing a lot with their, their smartphones. So that, that seems to be pretty, pretty commonplace. There are still CB radios around. So the radio inside the truck where you can kind of get on there and it'll transmit a signal and other trucks in the area. And honestly, there's no, there's no real purpose for that other than just kind of shooting the breeze. 
you know, with, with other drivers going down the road. So yeah, I guess cause the, you would have ways and any of those apps that would tell you where police are, how bad traffic is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like there's actually, I, I wish I knew it more, but there's a whole secret code of, uh, that drivers use on the radio that, that says certain things like alerting one another of where cops are, or, Hey, is this way station open or not? And they just, they, they, they use this code language to communicate with one another. And, uh, there's a few sites on there that kind of, it's like a dictionary of all the terms that, that these drivers use. I remember my brother at one point, my older brother, he, uh, he somehow got access to a CB and he was talking on it. And, uh, and, and then the guy came back and said, I, I think that guy just called me gay. <laughs> he was using some coded language and he didn't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, so many, I, I think people would probably get the impression that truck drivers are like loners, you know, I mean, out on the road by themselves. Um, I mean, we allow drivers to take a passenger with them. So if they want to take a spouse or someone they can, um, but for the most part, I think people think, oh, you know, these people are out on the road, you know, country, that's my impression. country yeah. songs sing about it and that sort of thing. But they're, they're incredibly social. Um, I mean, obviously not all of them, but a lot of the drivers I know, I mean, they'll strike up conversations with strangers, you know, all the time. I mean, that's what they're doing at the fuel stops, at truck stops, at the shipper receiver. I mean, they're just, they're striking up a conversation with everyone. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, when I get on the phone with a truck driver, wants to call to discuss something. I'm, I'm on the phone for 20, 30 minutes. I mean, that, that's how much time I have to budget for a driver call just because I, you know, they, they're so many of them are so talkative, you know, and they, they, they want to just see what's going on. And they, it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's like a form of entertainment, but it's just, uh, it's just something that so many of them do. Well, yeah. some professions become more comfortable talking on the phone. Like yeah. I know as I've gotten older, I'm way less comfortable talking on the phone. Like sure. if somebody just calls me up, I don't want to do it. But some professions like, you know, if you're talking to your spouse that way or your kids, you just get kind of yeah used to that. Yeah. You know, and, and so much, so much communication is, is going electronic, you know, for, for drivers too. So, I mean, when we are transmitting the load over to a driver, giving them directions saying, Hey, your appointment time has been changed or just even sending them a message saying, Hey, I need you to swing by the maintenance department to have your truck service. I mean, all that now is electronically. It's all through a, uh, you know, a satellite communication device in the truck. So we're sending messages to them, you know, and there are, there are efficiency reasons for that, but uh, yeah, you're right. It's almost like to kind of compensate for so much of, of, of how so much of the conversation has gone to just these electronic messages. They, they, they thrive when they get on the phone and they're just able to like talk, you know, like, like the way it probably once was. One of the comments on Reddit that I got, um, about this interview was somebody asking, do, does he actually talk to drivers? And it was an interesting thing because it caught me. I wasn't expecting that to be a question, but they were like, you know, we want to know, does he actually treat them like humans? And it's unbelievable. Yeah. No, I, I talk to drivers all the time, every single day and drivers have, drivers have a direct line to me. A lot of them have my cell phone number. Um, that's, that's, that's incredibly rare and it's a total missed opportunity for so many other trucking companies and their management teams in terms of kind of creating the culture for, you know, that's, that's a, you know, a driver culture. And we, you know, we have, we have open door policies. I meet every driver that comes through orientation. Our, our, the owner of the company. Whoa, that's it's, a lot of dedication to, yeah. to, to be doing five, six new people every single week. Yeah. Week I mean, in week out. Y- you know, it's, it, it's not as, it's, it's not as probably as big of a deal, you know, as, as it probably sounds, you know, I, I swing into orientation. I thank him for, for choosing LTI. I thank him for their, their, their service of being a trucker in general. Cause I mean, it's such thankless work so often. And, you know, I, I think that's a shame. So I just like popping in and saying, thanks for being a driver. Thanks for you know, what you do for you know, the, the country, the economy, our communities, our neighborhoods. I mean, everything that's on the store shelf touched a truck and so many people forget that. So, you know, I have an opportunity to say thanks for that and thanks for doing what you do and doing it here at our company. Um, that goes, a, that goes a long way. And, and our, our owner and CEO does the same thing. He, he comes in and he shakes hands with every single driver every single week. And, you'd be amazed at how many of them are like thrown off by that. They're like, well, I've never, I've worked at, you know, I've worked at umpteen companies through the years and I've never met the owner of of the company before. And, uh, I mean, that's, you know, it's a pity. Um, so many trucking companies, 
uh, don't even have direct face-to-face access with their fleet managers. So the, the people that they are talking to, communicating with, essentially their manager, they've never seen before, they've never met before. And if they want to have a face-to-face kind of sit-down meeting with them, you need to jump through all these sorts of hoops. You need to go to the corporate office. You essentially go, it's almost like a prison. You know, you, you're, you're going and you're talking to your fleet manager behind glass. And it's... It, it, really? Yeah, yeah. No, a, lar- a lot of large companies do that. Um, I, I suppose just because it's just such a, a rough and tumble like, I, yeah, industry or what? Yeah, I suppose it's for safety reasons. You know, um, a, a couple times, you know, drivers have you know become irate or made threats or something like that, and this is the way the companies kind of responded to be able to protect against that. Um, you know, luckily we haven't had to do that. If you know, we, we have a corporate office and the elevator doors open and. It's it's all open air. I mean, you know, you walk right out there. You can walk into my office. You can walk to you know your fleet manager. So I mean, we haven't had to, had to do that, but I would imagine that's probably the reason behind a lot of these companies having to do it. But yeah, I mean, drivers talk about it all the time. It's it's a very kind of cold, impersonal, uh, you know, environment. And and I mean, it sounds colder than many other environments, but it may just be the the that that aspect of culture that I just don't know very much about. Uh, I don't even know what the question is other than to say, like, yeah. I've been on I've been in docks late at night. Right. And that's rough and tumble work and it's rough and tumble people. Yeah. There. Um, but to imagine that you would have to go talk to your boss through glass is. Yeah. It's, it's actually really jarring to me. Yeah. It's um, I mean, th- th- there are so many so many parts of kind of the truck driver lifestyle and how these individuals, I think, are, are treated in the industry. That's, that's a shame. You know, I think for one, there's terrible stereotypes out there. Everyone thinks that the well, truck the time you see them in the news is when they've, they've, you know, solicited a 14 year old girl at a truck stop or, or the, it, the sex trafficking is blamed exactly. on truck drivers. Yeah. 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 It's stories of that or Tracy Morgan, right? Was it Tracy Morgan who got in the, in the really bad accident and the driver was out of hours. So driving illegally and, um, I mean, gosh, daytime TV, every, uh, every personal injury attorney is saying ads. Have you been in an accident with a big rig? You know, there's just, there's so many things coming from all directions that paint this truck driver as this wild cowboy who is not following the rules is, is on drugs, driving like a maniac. And, and it's just, to be honest, it's unfortunate because I mean, so many of them, um, you know, or, or the complete opposite. I mean, these are like blue collar, hardworking, uh, making tremendous sacrifices. They just like putting their head down, doing their work. It's, it's all a, a you know, like a, a matter of respect. You know, I just, I, I want the job that you sold me on that sort of thing. And, um, you know, they, I mean, the, the conditions again are, are so tough. I mean, finally shippers are starting to realize that, you know, in order to kind of do their part in this whole kind of ecosystem, they need to be more accommodating to the driver. So in other words, our customers, um, so many times our drivers go to deliver and they don't even have a bathroom on site that the drivers can utilize. Um, there might be like, you know, a, a, like a, like an outhouse or like a portable potty, that type of thing. And that's where the driver's expected to go to the bathroom if you need to use the restroom. Now, a few of them are starting to finally wake up and provide a little, like, you know, a lounge and a restroom. But I mean, for so long, it's just been conditions like that, uh, you know, rude people occasionally, drivers kind of getting it. And I mean, so many drivers, I mean, some drivers, you know, stand up for themselves and dish it back, you know, and they, they don't tolerate rudeness. Um, but I mean, so many of, of the drivers that I've met, they just, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they shrug it off. They have such thick skin. I mean, they're, they, they do not kind of like get their feelings hurt, you, you know? And what is, uh, what's in, what's a beginning driver making with the a guy gets through orientation? What, how much are they pulling down? Uh, they, they are probably pulling, um, 40 cents a mile, 40, maybe 43, 44 cents a mile. And, uh, if you extrapolate that over the miles, they're probably making lower 40 thousands. Okay. So re- relatively compared to other industries that you don't need to have special qualifications for or special education for, I mean, you can make a pretty decent, decent wage, um, easily make $50,000 a year or, or more. And then the more experienced, does that add on how much you get paid per mile? 
It does. Yeah. Yeah. So typically, um, experience matters, but what a lot of trucking companies do and what we do is uh, tenure with the company really matters. So if you've had 20 years experience, but hasn't been with our company, well, you know, that's worth something in the marketplace and, and, and wages do go up for that. But really, um, there's, there's kind of a fl- like a ceiling rather that drivers can be hired in a company with. And then from that point on, you got to stay with us if you want to get these raises to, to be um, getting the most premier pay. Yeah, interestingly enough, that's the same way the airline industry works. And I know because oh, I was a couple of weeks ago, I was in um, I don't know, Omaha, Nebraska or something. And I was talking to some pilots and they said, yeah. I uh, made the mistake that I kept switching companies yeah. instead of staying with one. And if I had stayed with one, I've had all this longevity because I don't get paid for the number of years I've worked only for the only yeah yeah you, you you really get like partial credit is is kind of what it what it seems like I mean the the I mean our, our highest paid drivers and the drivers that are pulling you know sixty thousand dollars a year um, I mean they're the ones that have been with the company for 15, 15 20 years I mean which is remarkable but um yeah so many drivers end up having to start from square one again you know they're they're starting and lack of a better word kind of at the bottom of the totem pole um, and then having to work their way up at a company. And meanwhile, they're getting offers thrown at them from every which direction. Recruiters are just, you know, bombarding these drivers with calls, and you you're kind of in a perpetual state of, oh man, is the grass greener on the other side of the hill? You know, I'm I'm seeing these sign-on bonuses, I'm seeing these new rates per mile. Um, I got to give this a shot to see if this is real. And we actually get a lot of we we get a lot of rehires. So um, the last time I checked. Over over a quarter of the drivers we hire a year worked with the company before, so they're, oh. they're rehires, and I think it's it's for that exact reason they they were lured away to another better offer, and then it kind of lost its luster, and then they figured it out and came back to to our company. And so, if we were to zoom the camera back a bit and kind of look at the overall picture of trucking and logistics, mm-hmm. what what percentage of the cost of a good because you were saying everything that's in a store was delivered by a truck. Do you have a sense for how much the shipping adds to the cost of a good? I'm sure it varies, but you know what? Um, I I don't actually. Uh, I don't because, from my perspective, we're getting tons of pallets of you know, a, let's say a food product loaded on a truck. I know that that that. Cumulatively, cumulatively weighs, you know, 40,000 pounds of cargo and how many pallets it is. But I don't know how many, uh, you know, boxes of pasta that, that he equates to. So it's kind of hard for me to, to, to say exactly what the, what the dollar amount is. I know shippers pack the, the truck full, you know, I mean, they maximize every cubic inch that they can legally of that trailer. Um, in order to reduce the transportation costs. Um, so I, I don't know what percentage of, you know, uh, the price of a gallon of milk is attributed to the transportation of it, but I will say it's, um, I mean, it's, it's not that far away of like a leap to realize that an increase in driver wages is going to be passed on to the consumer. I mean, you, you can see it all the time. I mean, the, the, whether it's insurance or maintenance or, you know, because we're in a driver shortage marketplace right now, you know, we're having to pay so much more for drivers. I mean, we have, the margins are so thin in trucking. We have no choice, but to go back to our customers and and ask for rate increases and try to earn those. And it's inevitable. They're going to have to be raising the prices of their goods in order to kind of absorb it. I mean, I I don't think any one person is going to be able to absorb the, the total increasing cost of, of all the different parts of the, the value chain. I think eventually, it, it, it always inevitably goes back to the consumer. So um, I, I, I don't know the specific numbers, but I just know it's it's so directly linked. And I think people kind of like lose sight of that. So, you know, where that kind of brings it back to like why people should care about trucking or why people should care about even certain, certain policies. I mean, right now the industry is short. I think 100,000 drivers is what the industry is short right now. So there's that much, there's that many more trucks sitting empty, needing drivers, their driver jobs posted, then there are drivers to fill those jobs. And that's just drivers. Um, mechanics, same way. So diesel mechanics. And are they not being filled because they're not getting paid enough? To, I mean, like the the, free market economics would say, if there's that many jobs out there, you're not paying enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, what I can say is that I've seen, I mean, when I first started, 
our average pay was 37 cents a mile. That was nine, nine, 10 years ago. Uh, now we're paying drivers 50 cents a mile. So it, it's been adjusted in order to kind of compensate for that change. Um, I, I, I would love to pay a driver more. If we could, if we could be successful in the rate increases that we would need from customers, I think it's warranted um, for a job like what they have. Um, but really, what it boils down to is that there's just you know too few people getting into the industry. No one is, very few people are raising their child to become a truck driver. You know, people are on track to go to college and do this or do that, and very rarely is trucking a part of the conversation. Um, and in addition to that, another reason that there's such a driver shortage is because legally you have to be 21 years old to drive a truck. And almost every insurance policy I've ever seen for a trucking company mandates that your drivers are 23 and older. So really what that means is, uh, you know, a, a 23-year-old driver is pretty much the youngest driver that I can really hire. Wow. And then you wouldn't be and getting those people that are straight out of school looking for e- something exactly. they're already in another yeah. industry. So if someone is, you know, like, you know, let's say finishing up high school, they're, I mean, they're going to be landing in another trade. If, if they don't want to go to college and they, or they want to go to a trade school and get into construction or carpentry or something like that, they, I mean, they're not going to hold out for their trucking job five years later. You know what I'm saying? They're going to land in another industry and that's going back to the autonomous trucks. So if the job got more automated, I'd be curious to see um, what sort of regulations could change regarding the age restrictions. Of because a you think that uh, a lot of the driving in autonomous driving will be sitting at the wheel being the human if something goes Mo- wrong. Monitoring the the command center, the controls, you know, making sure that, that things are going okay and if things need to be adjusted. I mean, I don't know how a pilot works, but, you know, I know so much of flying that plane is automated, you right. know. Um, I would imagine there'd be somebody monitoring the, the movement of the truck and intervening if necessary, if something really wonky happens. Um, if that happens, I think... That, that sounds a lot more techy. That sounds more innovative. That could attract younger people. If if uh, it was proven to be safe, I think the the general public and regulators would be more comfortable saying, "Okay, well, it's okay to have you know a you know uh, lower ages if we're just monitoring equipment." Or if uh, that that person that could be a truck driver could be behind a desk monitoring trucks moving. In more of a dispatcher role, or imagine like drone flights would, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, this I could, is remarkably like agriculture. Yeah, I mean, it, it could switch to that. In which case, you know, maybe you don't need to have a twenty-three-year-old behind the desk. Maybe you can have someone who has an interest in these things and can be able to monitor things from a computer. Um, so, I mean, that's 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 a possibility. But th- those are reasons why there's such a driver shortage right now. And in person, I think diesel mechanic shortage is ten times harder. I mean, to hire someone like that, and you know, what's, what's so interesting is these things matter because your, your goods are going to go up more in price. And I mean, I, I just, I can't, you know, uh, be, I can't ignore the fact that like immigration could be a huge benefit to fixing something like this. I mean, there's so many jobs available. So many companies need these people and there seemingly aren't enough people that want to have these types of jobs, at least not when they're in their thirties, you know? So if, if someone can kind of get smart about the fact that there's so many people that want to, you know, come and, and earn a good wage, which you can in trucking, um, and are willing to sacrifice, which they're already making a lot of sacrifices typically, um, I, you know, I would love to see somebody put together a, an intelligent solution with immigration as opposed to just the extremes of the discussion. There's nothing productive coming out of it. It really could in an industry like trucking. Do you right now hire people on visas or is it, are they all American citizens? <sighs> You know what? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not I'm not really familiar with um, what programs we're doing now. I, I haven't worked directly in the recruiting department and what our policies are there. I know we we have done some things before where we have sponsored people and we've we've tried to help help uh, be a part of the process. I know we've done it not necessarily in immigration, but we've done it on um, like criminal reform. We've taken people that have been um, nonviolent. You know, um, they, they they you know they've been released from from prison. They're For part non-violent of these offenses. nonviolent offenses, and they're part of these second chance programs. And um, we've worked with judges and with uh, almost like parole officers 
to get them in a trucking job. And, you know, they're, they're administered more drug, random drug tests than our other driver population per the stipulations of the program um, to get those people, you know, back into a job like, like that. Um, we've even had a few kind of outside of the box conversations with some local uh, homeless shelters that are here in town, because if you think about it, trucking could be a perfect solution for someone that is down on their luck and literally homeless. I mean, you get a job and a home all in one. Now it's, it's, wow. you know, I wouldn't if, have expected if, that. if you think about it and, uh, you know, naturally you need to train them. You need to, I mean, we have, we have, you know, truck simulators that we can help kind of train them on. We can put them on a training program, help them, uh, point them in the direction of getting their CDL license. Uh, but if all those pieces were in place, I mean, that could be a solution there too, uh, as long as, you know, insurers were on board and, you know, all the other parties. I mean, it sounds to me like you like guys that. are like facing a real, real challenge if you're saying, hey, we're going to the we're going to the jails and we're going to the homeless shelters in in looking for people. A- yeah. At what point does it become a problem for our economy? I I personally think it, it's it's influencing the economy right now. I don't think, I don't think the, um, I mean, the stock market was a little weird this week, but I, I don't think in general, um, the economy is in as sound of a, as a state state as, as uh, people thought for the last couple of years. And I think it hasn't been drawn a lot of attention, but I, I think this is influencing it. I think our inability to hire, um, drivers to fill the seats, let alone high quality drivers, um, you know, I mean, that's another issue too. I mean, your, your accident rates go up, your cost and maintenance go up, your cost and fuel go up when you get somebody who's lesser quality because you're compromising on what you're going to put up with because, you know, in the end of the day, you need someone behind the wheel. Um, so I think those things are impacting things right now. And, you know, I mean, where we're at right now in, in the summer of, uh, I mean, like 2019, they're, they're below what the freight forecasts were. Um, for, what does that mean? So we're always working. The uh, Truckload Carriers of America has, you know, a, a team of economists that are trying to put a finger on what do you, what what do forecasts look like for shippers? So how much product are they going to be, are they going to be, you know, producing that is going to need to be shipped at some point? Because um, that helps us kind of strategically plan, like, hey, what's the rate environment going to be in a couple of years? Um, should we add capacity and add trucks, or should we kind of stay the same size we're at now? And um, everything was going to be, you know, I mean, everyone's talking about just a tremendous amount of uh, loads that need to be shipped, and we're not seeing it as much. So I think very subtly and kind of discreetly, a lot of shippers are kind of like, letting their inventories build. They're not pushing out as much product as we thought they were going to. So, I mean, and if you think about it, I mean, it's one of the earliest stages of kind of the economic implications of Mm -hmm. things, you know, because I mean, we're, we're on the earlier end of people buying their goods. So, so if things start slowing down in trucking, you can say exactly somebody thinks it's going to slow down further down the line. Yeah. It's, it's like a barometer for, for kind of what's to come in the economy. And, And right now things, Things are not catastrophic by any means, um, but it could be so much better. And and right now, you can tell that there's that there's some pain points. And I think I think this is a big part of it. Is that accelerated over the last few months? Or, uh, yeah, I would say the the for the entire 2019 year it has. You know, 20, 2018 was decent. Twenty seventeen was great. Twenty sixteen and fifteen were were okay. Um, the years before that were still lackluster. It was like a residual effect of of the recession. Um, but yeah, uh, twenty nineteen things seem to be a lot slower than than they have been. And it's um, would you lay this at the feet of the China trade war? That's impacting it. I uh, I know. I mean, I I know it is. You can just you can tell. Um, but That's interesting because, you know, you hear about it in the news, but mm-hmm. if you're just a regular consumer, yeah. you don't see this. I mean, maybe baseball gloves go up 25 cents or, you know, it's hard yeah. to get like your little knickknacks, but not really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, we don't do a whole lot of transportation with ports, um, but we can tell they're all of a sudden, I mean, we've always stayed refrigeration space and we've always typically been in the Midwest, East Coast. We don't really go a whole lot west of, of Denver. Uh, but still, um, we've seen a lot more trucks appear in our marketplace. So I think what that's sending, what that's saying to us is a lot of people that have been working out of the port of Long Island or, 
uh, or uh, not Long Island, Long Beach, you know, in California and or people that are down south in Texas or Louisiana. Um, I think they're 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 slow. So they're they're hauling instead of hauling cargo containers, they're moving their trucks up and they're they're all of a sudden in the dry space or they're in the refrigeration space. So dry is just non-refrigeration, refrigeration, temperature controlled cargo. Um, because we're seeing a lot more trucks all of a sudden be flooding, you know, in the same arena as what we operate in. And I would imagine a lot of that is being diverted from from the coasts and the ports because of the situation with tariffs and and the uncertainty behind it. Wow. Yeah. And so what happens in a market where you start having more and more trucks in your, in your space? Well, I mean, it impacts the, the rate environment. Um, I mean, that's, that's for sure. Um, it, it impacts the, the trade cycles on trucks. If, if you think about it, because if there, if there's a, you know, all of a sudden more equipment available geographically in the same area that, that you operate in, you're going to get less for trucks. You're going to hang on to your equipment longer, that sort of thing. Um, it, it just means, you know, a lot more competition, you know, so just being able to do kind of the basics, right. Of, of load planning, try to maintain profitability, um, compete with drivers and that sort of thing. Um, the, I mean, just kind of the, the back to basics. One of the things that I think we'll hear more in the presidential election coming up is infrastructure, Yeah, which is. You know, regular people, the most of the infrastructure they see is they cross over their bridge on the commute or they, you know, when they're going to grandma's. But Mm -hmm. your your business probably sees it a lot. What is the state of infrastructure in the United States, interstates and bridges? And, you you know, I I don't know directly a a lot about the infrastructure piece. I know that, you know, the, the taxes that we pay by you know for every gallon of fuel that we purchase is you going pay an towards, added tax on that yeah yeah so every gallon of diesel we buy has a has a tax that's changing depending on laws that are passed that go towards infrastructure um same sort of thing the we we get license plates that we can operate in all um you know all 48 lower 48 states um the price of these plates are, are going up so all of those. What is for, the, what is the license plate cost? that's like the cost of doing business right there right? Uh, yeah so. yeah it's about twenty two hundred dollars for a year you're kidding. Yeah. So for all of your 300 trucks. Yeah, they all have to have one. Yeah. And we have every to, single year. Yeah. Every single year. And we have to, it, it, it's kind of crazy. We, we literally have to write a check. I mean, it's uh, it's not a pay over time thing. Every, every March you have to do your, it's called IRP renewal and you have your list of, of trucks and how many you need to renew license plates for. And you times it by, you know, it gives you a dollar amount because it's, it's a different dollar amount for every company because every state has a different rate that they apply. So you need to show how many miles you drove in each state in order to kind of get your custom number. Um, oh, I did more Illinois miles than I did Missouri or this or that. And typically it averages about $2,200. So times that by all your, your fleet and every you single it, truck and, and cut, then cut divide the, that around every single consumer that's paying for the, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and then that money you, you were talking about goes towards infrastructure. Yeah. So, so that goes through, uh, towards infrastructure. Um, the only other I probably thought that I have on infrastructure is the shortage of like rest areas. Now, I mean, there's private rest areas, you know, like what you see at these fuel stops, but then there's also, um, rest areas that are, that are maintained the same way roads are maintained. They're just, you know, just like exits off the highway. And there's a tremendous shortage. So even though there's like a, a truck shortage and a driver shortage, we we have a, a parking shortage that's even worse than than that. I mean, with the trucks and drivers we do have on the road, there's not enough place for them to all park. I never thought about so, that. Yeah, like it, they could show up at a rest area thinking, hey, I'm going to get some and, sleep in and there's and it's no full. Spot. Yeah. So that, that's something that happens a lot in the driver community is people kind of sharing tips and tricks of, hey, you know, this, this rest stop off of, you know, exit so-and-so on this highway after this time, you know, you're going to be able to get a spot, but don't even try if you arrive at this time, you know, so people kind of share that information. But yeah, I remember the first time I saw it, it's, it's a pretty wild, wild thing. I mean, if you happen to be taking a road trip late at night and you know, it's uh, 10 or 11 o'clock and you're in a really rural area, you might all of a sudden, you, I mean, you drive right by, you don't even realize it. But if you drive by a rest area, just like gaze over at it and look as you're passing on the highway. I mean, every single spot is full with, with a, a driver sleeping in it. All the trucks are lined up there. And not only is it full, it's overflowed. So there are drivers parked on the shoulders of the exit, um, the on and off ramps, um, for the, for each truck stop. 
And that's the way it is for every single truck truck stop that I've seen on the highway uh, for the last couple of years. I mean, in the middle of the night, it is packed and there, there's not enough of them and there's not enough room. And technically it's illegal. I mean, if you're, if you're parking on the, on the shoulder, um, you're, you're not allowed to do that. And if, you know, a state patrol officer, you know, they, they kind of tolerate it because they understand this is a big issue. Um, so sometimes most of the time they look the other way, but, um, occasionally you have somebody who has a bad day and they'll just write tickets to every single one of those drivers and put it in their windshield. And, um, you know, the companies typically pay it because they understand the driver has no choice, but that's a, that's a major, um, infrastructure shortfall. How does a problem like that get solved? <sighs> you know, I think what, what happens is it, it, this kind of speaks, I guess, to the interconnectedness of trucking, you know, I, maybe it's like this at other companies or in other industries, but, um, again, it's just, it's a factor that needs to be figured into the entire environment of, of trucking. So the, the rate that a customer is willing to pay per mile to, for you to move their freight needs to accommodate for the fact that fuel taxes are going to go up, um, registration costs are going to go up, driver workforce is going to go. I mean, all these things need to need to happen um, so that we can. So all those things need to happen. So we need a, a rate that can accommodate it without a bunch of trucking companies going out of business and having to shoulder the cost of all this, the, all these increased costs. Um, so in, in terms of that not being totally pushed to the consumer, then the other things need to happen. Like um, outside parties can supply or, or create gateways for people to get into trucking, you know, drivers, mechanics, that sort of thing. Um, those sorts of things can make a big difference. Um, a logical and rational regulation would help, you know, ease up the burden of trucking companies. We can, we can, um, operate more efficiently therefore we can be more competitive with what our are rates. some rules you would change that are going on right now i i think the uh the the brake interruption uh one needs to be changed so if um if a driver is out of hours and and they can drive 10 to 11 in a day if they've had a certain number of if they haven't worked more than 12 consecutive or something like that. Yeah. It's a, it's a 14 hours of on duty rule. So, so the moment you start work in the morning, you have 14 hours later before you have to call it for the day. So that could be a combination of getting your truck weighed, fueled, driving, all of that is considered on, on, on duty time. Um, and then after that, you have to take a 10 hour break. It's a, it's a mandated 10 hour break. And if you get that break interrupted at any point in time, even if it's for two seconds, you have to restart your break. So if you're seven hours in to your break and all of a sudden someone at the shipper, you know, knocks on your truck window and says, move your truck and you get the next one in here and you're like, you know, man, I'm, I'm six, seven hours into my break. I, I, I like, I got to stay here. Um, that, that needs to happen. So there, there should be uh, driver coercion rules to where shippers need to be regulated. They need to have regulation imposed upon them to be, uh, in order to be accommodating to the regulations that truck drivers and trucking companies have. So it should be illegal for a shipper to mandate someone to move their truck. If, if a driver, um, you know, is, is in the middle of their break, there should be designated, you know, um, parking areas or something like that for, for trucks. There should be, um, same sort of thing, believe it or not. Um, the, the rest stop dilemma uh, a cop very well could say you need to move your truck driver's sleeping. It's going to trip their brake. They're going to have to start over again. That, that rule needs to be, needs to be changed. Um, I don't think you can, you either need to provide a safe place for the driver to park uninterrupted, or there should be a, uh, some sort of rule or regulation saying that you cannot force them to move their truck if they're in the middle of their break. Cause this is going to wreak havoc on the rest of the schedule. Do you think that'll happen? Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of discussion of driver coercion rules, um, and and it is. I don't know what the enforcement is going to look like, but uh, that that will have to something will have to happen there, and there seems to be some discussion around it. Um, just because I think again, shippers are starting to realize that the pain it actually puts on them as well. So I mean, if trucking companies have to go through all this, in the end of the day, it's going to have to mean you know higher a higher rate, higher cost of doing business. So. I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that something could happen there. Um, uh, kind of on a different note, I think there needs to be some more, um, 
more kind of developed regulation around food safety. So we, we do all refrigerated trucking. So everything is temperature controlled and cargo controlled, but occasionally there are uh, refrigeration malfunctions. So this, they call it a reefer device. Uh, if the reefer device malfunctions, it's not blowing cold air and you have pallets of, it could be frozen beef or chicken or something like that. Something that if, if it rises up to a certain temperature could be unsafe, you know? And right now there's very little, there's like the food safety modernization act and there's some other regulation that's out there, but it, it doesn't go far enough to help us give good lot, good guidelines on why product, uh, should or shouldn't be refused from, uh, from a receiver. So, um, what'll happen is we will load a product, you know, let's say it's frozen chicken and the refrigeration unit, let's say malfunctions, right? It, it, a fan belt tears off or something like that. So the unit is shut down. Mm-hmm. There's no cold air being pumped through there. Now the trailer's insulated and it can get really cold in the trailer, but after a certain period of time, it's going to rise up to temperature. Right now we have no choice because we, we obviously don't want anyone to get sick or, you know, uh, we deliver the chicken, don't say anything and they don't notice. And then all of a sudden someone gets sick and it, it'd be a terrible situation. So we always take the conservative approach by saying, Hey, just to let you know, during this trip, there was a, a, a reefer unit malfunction. The unit was off from this period to this period. It got back up to temp at this period. It, you know, there was only disruption from this certain time period. Um, and, and we just were forthcoming with that information. We have to be. And a lot, a lot of times the response is, okay, well, you're gonna have to dispose of the product. This is a cargo claim because they don't want to take the risk either just like we don't so i think there should really be some regulation out there for um you know that's kind of like science-based saying you know hey this is these are the temperatures that the for these durations of time that if this type of product is exposed to this it's no longer um safe for consumers to to you know eat it or consume it um right now that that isn't really out there to our knowledge and what it means is that everything's got to go perfect and if not you just you're having cargo claims out the nose. Oh, and then that makes all refrigeration more expensive. More expensive, yeah. yeah. One of the things, uh, a few years ago, maybe a year ago, I was in Indianapolis, and a woman that was in the livestock industry and I were talking, and mm-hmm. she said there's a major problem with the with the amount of hours that a trucker can drive when they're driving livestock, and that those rules were going to change. Yeah, so I don't know a, a lot about that, but I do know that they actually. Um, are regulated differently than like our drivers are. So because we're hauling cargo, you know, you have your normal hours service, that's it, end of discussion. If you're hauling livestock, like like pigs or cows or something like that, it's more of a time is of the essence deal. Right. So there are actually certain di- uh, times of the day that you can legally move and cannot legally move. And temperatures as well, I believe, like outside ambient air temperatures. Because if you have 200, let's say, let's say pigs on a truck, and you are driving her in rush hour and stop and go traffic. It's a hundred degrees outside. I mean, those animals are going to start dying right. in, in transit. And, and you know, that's, it's a, an unsafe situation for the animal too. Um, so a lot of times they, I believe they drive through the night and they're allowed, they're allowed, I think more often than not to drive straight through. So if it, it doesn't matter if it, uh, if their clock ran up at this certain time, they can continue going because you can't just shut down the truck for a night with having a bunch of cattle, you know, uh, on, on the truck. So they are regulated differently. And I, I, from my understanding, it's a lot more lax in order to make sure that it's safe for the animal. Yeah. I'm, I remember her, uh, talking about how she thought the rules were going to change and that this would cause a great, I mean, she was really distressed. It was one of those times where really? you're in a public place and you're like, Whoa, uh, this, this woman is genuinely upset about yeah. trucking rules. And I would have no idea that this is a big deal. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, what are the aspects of trucking that, you know, you're, you're at a party and you want to impress people with your knowledge of the, of the trucking world? What, what is something you bring up that surprises people? Well, um, I guess probably like two things, uh, like really, I'm always kind of pounding this drum and always bringing it up cause I think it's cool to talk about. And we already touched on both of them, but the first is the, um, just awareness for how trucking is all around us. And, and it's a huge part of the economy. It's a huge way that the world goes around that I don't think a lot of people realize. So, you know, I always like to point out that everything that you see in this room or everything you see in your pantry or everything you see at the grocery store at some point in its journey touched a truck. 
So it really is all around you and, and it's happening all the time. And it's something that you don't think about all of a sudden the food just appears at the grocery store, you know? Um, so I always, I always kind of like reminding people about that. I think that's a really kind of powerful, um, you know, image to, to drop. And the other one is just the resilience of the driver. You know, I, I mentioned to you how these, these folks just have thick skin. They're out on the road for weeks at a time. Um, and they're just, they're copers. I mean, they, they just, they find ways to make it work all the time. And, um, I mean, one, one story I remember that I, that I liked, like, I think the moment I kind of realized this, I was, I was pretty early in the, uh, in the trucking world. I, uh, I, w- I was downtown St. Louis and a driver came by to visit and, uh, him and I went out to lunch and we went to a grocery store down the street that had a big prepared food, fu- prepared food section. So we were there and, uh, they had like a little area you can eat and that sort of thing. So he, he bought like this cold, it was like cold prepared foods. And there was like, it was like a burrito or something or like a, like a wrap and it was cold and we brought it upstairs and there's like a balcony kind of cafeteria where we can eat. And the microwave was out of, out of order. And I was like, Oh, do you, do you want to go get something different? Like you can't warm that up. And, you know, he's like, no, it's cool. And he just like, he ate it like it ate a cold burrito, just like, <laughs> like didn't hesitate. And then it kind of like, kind of like, uh, the thought just kind of the light bulb came on and I was like, man, I was like, this guy must encounter the equivalent of a broken microwave situation, like on a daily basis, you know, like you can't let it just like completely ruin your day or throw your plan off. Like how many times does he, does something not go to plan? You know, he goes, goes to the truck stop and every spot's taken. Oh, well, you know, he goes to the shipper and it takes him eight hours to be loaded. Oh, well, you know, um, you know, these things are just happening all the time and the drivers, they, they just roll with it. You know, do you in your life have like a stoic mentality about, you know, just, you know, fatigue more? <laughs> um, I, I don't have any like specific, you know, philosophy, at least not that I could articulate. I'm sure there are, you know, things behind the scenes that are, that, you know, like positions I have. I think um, having a little bit of struggle is probably a good thing. So it kind of like goes to like the driver thing, you know, to not have everything perfect, I think is cool. So I kind of like challenging myself like that. Like if it's really, really cold out one day, I'll like drive the car with no heat on and just see if I like make it in my trip. Like, you know, it's zero degrees outside and I'll be like, I'm just going to wear my jacket and like, just like tough it out. Like little things like that are kind of like fun, kind of corny ways of toughen, toughening up a little bit and just like exercising your ability just to make do and, and kind of deal with it and roll with it. Um, so aside from that, not, not a whole lot, but I like kind of doing those little things. And the reason we couldn't do the interview yesterday is because you, uh, mountain bike. Yeah. In yeah. Missouri. Yeah. 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 Believe it or not. Um, uh, you know, I, I live in Missouri and everything's flat, but I like, I'm like a mountain enthusiast. So, um, there aren't a whole lot here, but any like sort of outdoor mountain sports, like I really, I really like, so I love mountain biking. I love rock climbing. Um, I'm even, I like hiking, trekking, that sort of thing. And I'm really, I'm trying hard. It's really tough, but I'm trying hard to get into mountaineering. So it's, it's hard to do in St. Louis, but I've been able to, to do a little bit here and there, like up in Alaska and stuff to try to learn that. And I think that'd be really cool to like create some trips around, but yeah, that's the type of thing that I like to do. And you have two tiny little girls who are, who are, uh, upstairs at the studio, um, yeah. hanging out with our wives right now when they are 18 years old. Mm-hmm. What will trucking be like in the United States? <sighs> trucking will be, well, it's, it's going to be more advanced than it is today. It's incredibly technologically based and I don't think it gets credit for that. I mean, there's so much data and there's, there's so much, uh, you know, like it behind what's, what's happening on there. I think that'll be, there's so much more room for that to skyrocket. So I think there's going to be a a ton of tech diverted towards trucking. I think that it's going to gain a lot of attention. I don't know if it's going to gain a lot of attention from, um, like techie companies like Tesla or or Uber. I mean, all of them are starting to touch trucking for like the, for even Amazon, you know, they're starting to like graze, you know, up against it a little bit. Um, I think that the semis all electric at this point, um, is that the future, you know, it's, do you think? it's possible. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to be like natural gas. I don't, I don't, it might be a diesel hybrid mixture. It, it might be all electric depending on, you know, like the things that Tesla's doing. 
Um, I think it'll be more automated. I don't know. But if you don't be... think trucks will run on natural gas? I don't think so. Man, yeah. I wish I would have known you a few years ago. I made a large bet on that. Did and you? Lost. <laughs> yeah, I know. So did like T Boone Pickens and all yeah, those guys. Yeah, that, that was following yeah. his lead, and I got I got my ass handed to me. Yeah, we we even uh, we, we even had Freightliner <laughs> come by and show us one. I mean, we were we were like, man, is this something we need to have on our radar? So I mean, we looked at it, but um, I think it'll be more automated. I don't know. Like I said, what way that's going to be. I don't think it's going to mean hundreds of thousands of people out of a job. I think I, I honestly don't. I don't think that about um, automation. I don't think it's going to like displace a ton of workers in the long really? term. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, like you're not just saying that because you run a company and you have employees. No, and- no. I mean, I honestly, I think uh, I think I mean, you know, I. I, I would imagine that any big discussion about a huge burgeoning tech trend had a lot of fear around it in the past. I think everyone was like, man, what's what's email going to do? What's Excel going to do? Like, you know, maybe not those specific things, but stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Computers in general. And, you know, man, it's going to I, I, what's going to happen to my bookkeeping job? What's going to happen to my this job? And, you know, in hindsight, I mean, look at how many jobs it's created. It's created hundreds of thousands of new jobs. I mean, there weren't SEO positions 20 years yeah. ago, 25 years ago. I mean, digital advertising. I mean, th- th- you can make a huge list of new jobs that have been created as a result of a new of a new kind of society. So did it, you ever read that uh, PDF that was floating around called Bullshit Jobs? Uh, no, where, I don't think the I guy, did. So, so it sounds familiar. I'll look up the author of it and yeah. throw it in the show notes. But the guy had an interesting um, f- uh, point of view that I had not heard before. And uh-huh. basically he was saying, you know, you guys are all worried about the robot revolution yeah. taking and automation taking all your jobs. Well, guess what? It already did. And the way that it did it is that most office jobs instead of being 40 hours a week of work are actually about four hours of work a week. Yeah. And people are spending the remaining aspect of their time trying to convince their boss, trying to develop enough metrics to prove to their boss that they're busy. And then their boss is collating <laughs> those and saying yeah. to their boss, look at how much I'm managing all these people. And most of the time that they spend is in meetings, sure. not actually producing things. And b- yeah. because email made it so much easier to communicate excel made it so much easier to get your your finances done and i, yeah. I it, it just strikes me during this conversation because that's probably true in corporate america from what i've seen like yeah. a huge amount of people but it's not true in trucking like you need those hours right now sure yeah yeah that's interesting um yeah i don't but i don't think i don't think a, a bunch of people are going to be you know on the unemployment line you know for for that i think the nature of their jobs will change I think it might be more of a uh, monitoring, you know, the engine, the way maybe a train conductor is monitoring things. Um, I think it could change into that. It could change into more of a dispatch behind the desk position. It could it could uh, just mean platooning, you know, uh, something like that, where trucks are just linked up with one another all in a line going down the highway and they enter the platoon. They disengage manual control. And the truck goes down the line. I mean, it could almost it, more like a train then. Yeah. Yeah. Like a train going down one lane of the highway. Wow. Essentially. Um, you know, it, it couldn't, like I said, manifest itself in any of those ways. But so I think it will be more automated. I think it'll be more automated because I think it'll be, it'll be safe. And I think that it will, um, um, it'll, it'll, it'll be in response to, uh, a, a workforce shortage. And yeah. what do you think of, uh, so, cause right now the automation fear is being used, uh, by some of the presidential candidates to say, the reason you should vote for me is because automation is going to take things like, and they specifically cite trucking every mm-hmm. single time. And they say transportation is 12% of the economy. Yeah. And, um, if that gets automated, all those people are out of work. Therefore, vote for me because I will get you universal basic income. Meaning, yeah. I'll you'll get a thousand dollar check to do what you will to do what you will with it. Sure. What, are, what are your thoughts there? Well, I, I guess first off, you know, I wouldn't say that this is the case to take these jobs away because it's it's a lot of people's livelihood. Um, but seemingly, too, these are uh, these are jobs that a lot of people don't want. You know, and I think I think this is that's just a fact. I mean, like, like, I don't think we're arguing with the fact that a lot of people aren't raising their kids to become truck drivers. Um, and there's all these stereotypes, all these reasons behind it. But um, these are I mean, 
uh, we, we can find other jobs. And like I said, I think it's going to, it's, it's going to change the way they, they work and the style of, and the nature of their job, um, for, for the better. So it, it's going to change a truck driver from having to, to drive 120,000 miles a year. You know, um, th- they might be able to, to do something where they're home every night now, all of a sudden, um, they might be able to do something. They might still be involved in the industry, um, but in a different way to where it's it's healthier and happier for their lifestyle. I I mean I think optimistically it can go in in one of those directions. Um, you know I for, I forgot your question about a universal basic uh, yeah income, universal so. big ba- yeah. Um, I mean if you don't think the jobs are going away then it's yeah it, it makes it to where like I'm not all the way there yet. Um, but I think that taking that same concept on like more of a like a specific or like micro scale, I mean, if a driver is not behind the wheel, they could be in the back sleeper berth playing a guitar or Skyping with family or learning a new skill or, or a language or playing a game or it frees up time for them to do what they want to do. You know, they, they don't need to have their hands 10 and 2 uh, monotonously look, staring down a road. So in terms of like quality of life and freeing up your like own human co- like capacity to do the things you want to do, um, I think you can achieve those things without, you know, saying, well, everyone gets, you know, 8,000 bucks and, you know, do what you want with it. I think, I think you're going to get like the same sort of effect, but just on the less uh, grandiose package. Oh, that's really interesting effect. that the automation yeah. in and of itself will be give freeing. You the free, ah, yeah, I've be the free, heard that will before. be the freeing effect. Yeah. That's a, that's a very, uh, that's unorthodox. I had not yeah. heard that in all of the discussions so far. Yeah. I mean, that's the way I would, I would think it's going to shake out, but we'll do you say. think our interstates will remain the same or our kind of roads or will we make some dramatic well, changes? I I'm hoping, um, I mean, cause I, I, I personally care a lot for the environment, so I would love to see less pavement and less concrete. And I think that, uh, staying on the topic of automation, if that were to happen, um, you could actually reduce, I mean, a lot of roads and a lot of roadways because you'd be able to reduce the number of trucks out on the road. Um, you could, you could, because you could have them running 24 well, hours a day. Yeah. And- I mean, if, if, if our drivers are driving on average a certain number of days, I mean, yeah, you can, uh, you know, have them drive 24 hours a day, the- theoretically, you know. So if you could do that, you could, you know, decrease your fleet size by, by a third or something like that and be able to just, you know, uh, get greater utilization out of each one of your trucks. So if you have fewer trucks on the road, maybe you could have, you know, you don't need an eight lane highway. Maybe you have a, you know, six lane highway or something like that. Um, you know, rest stops and things like that. Maybe you won't need cause drivers are, are remotely, they're not in the truck or, um, you know, that they can get their rest while the truck's moving maybe. So maybe you don't need, uh, those as much. You know, one of the interesting, as I travel around the country, I go to a lot of ag um, speeches and yeah. and get out to conventions. There is a huge cultural divide between people living in the cities and people living in rural America. And a lot of people don't realize yeah. that one third of all Americans live in towns of 10,000 people or less. And sure. that's a lot of people. Yeah. When automation comes, uh, if, if that happens, it it will be, it would seem to me to be very isolating though. Those people, uh, like you will continue to have like essentially different countries within the United States because the people living in the country and the people living in the city be very, very different. And that's already happening right now. Like you go to the countryside. Sure. It's different than what it is in the city. Hmm. That's interesting. I never heard that. I never thought about that. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess in that, in that sense too, like diversity would, would go down. Right. I mean, you would be staying, with your community and that's, and that's it, you know? So yeah, that'd be, that'd be interesting. The other interesting part of automation and you were talking about not wanting as much, uh, pavement and concrete is, uh, grocery delivery. And like, I think this is the most, I think, I think this will have a huge impact on the way our cities are built because, um, like if I can order, if I have enough foresight and I'm disciplined enough, I get all of our groceries delivered and then occasionally we'll go to pick up milk or something, you know, that I need. If you limit, if you lower the number of people that are going into a grocery store, mm-hmm. then you can change. Cause right now a grocery store's parking lot 
is based on its size is based on how many square feet of grocery do you have now we multiply that out to make a certain number of parking spaces and those parking spaces are yeah. for maximum capacity because you don't ever want people to come and not be able to get a seat or yeah. be able to get a parking spot but if you have all these people getting their groceries delivered yeah the amount of parking lot space that you're going to need is going to be cut in sure. half in yeah it's 75 percent yeah and now you're going to have all of this space to do something with who knows what they're going to do with yeah. all that parking lot space yeah yeah i know just restore it to uh to grassland or you know just <laughs> like like do nothing to it that'd be a novel concept you know rip it up and let the dirt become something you know yeah. i mean that'd be, that'd be pretty interesting it, it i think it'll make a big difference yeah. i mean a lot of our culture in suburban america at least is roads with with uh, buildings that are set far back from the road because of a huge amount of pavement that you have to have to be able to get on there i mean it's going to change the actual landscape of our cities i think yeah yeah that's interesting too there's always been this um there's always been this this concept in logistics uh called the last mile so that's always been the um the uh, supposedly the hardest part right is the last mile problem so if you if you have this good you know, how do you, how do you get it the final mile? And society has fixed that by creating stores, you know, well, we're just going to have, you know, a dumping ground for all this product and people are going to go to the store. And, and our last mile then is nothing more than an LTL delivery. Like what we were talking about earlier, you know, I'm going to go to this grocery store. I'm going to go to this grocery store, this uh, supermarket store, whatever, um, and drop off my freight there. Really though, what's interesting is in, in, uh, delivery, like grocery delivery, um, they're re bringing up the last mile as something that they're not putting on the consumer. Um, they're, 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 they're saying, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll handle this. We will have our, have the, the gallon of milk at, at the, the whole foods. And then, you know, one of the Instacart people is going to bring it to you. And that's always been like the, the hardest part of anyone's logistical challenge is how do you make that, make that happen, you know, especially like given all the different factors, right. People leave, live differently or live in different areas. Um, there's like peak shopping times and, you know, Thanksgiving week and this and that, how do you logistically make it work? Um, and, and no one's really ever been able to figure it out. There've been a bunch of cases, even in like New York city, where we have concentrated people where a lot of companies have always failed trying to, trying to master the, the last mile delivery solution. Um, this is like the first time where it's been like resurfaced and like people are pretty confident about, no, we can make this happen, you know? And, and I, I don't, I, I'd be curious to see how it shakes out and if they're able to do it, if it stays economical and if, um, consumers use it, adopt it and companies continue to offer it. You know. My prediction is that there will be a, a way to put some sort of refrigerated box outside of your house yeah. that you can also lock Sure. And once you have that problem solved, then you don't even have to limit the delivery to when people are home. Yeah. Now you can now you can put it like just put it right there in their box. Well, I mean, yeah, some people are like letting them letting uh, delivery people have access into their home. Yeah. The, you no know, like they, they, they remotely like unlock the door and just go in and, you know, put the stuff in the fridge. Yeah. Kind of kind of crazy. My parents had an idea about that. They were like, yeah, you know, with Amazon deliveries and uh, grocery deliveries, like we need to create a set of planters that go out in front of people's homes that the, the under section of the planter is a secure lockbox for your for your um, e-commerce package. I or totally your agree. Groceries Absolutely. And, and maybe, yeah, maybe it could be temp controlled so that you can leave your eggs. And, and who better to do stuff. it than the guy that runs a refrigerated <laughs> trucking company? Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask um, about Amazon and how much yeah. that has impacted uh, trucking. Is it something you can detect or they've always been there? And so in the time that you've been in, in trucking? Well, me personally, I've, I've probably been a little bit more um, immune to, to the Amazon effect because uh, my, my experience has always been rooted in the refrigeration cargo piece, which it's, it's less to do with, you know, books and furniture and clothing and accessories and the stuff that Amazon is, is, you know, pumping out to everyone. Um, you know, and, and, and also, you know, we're, we're talking like large scale deliveries. So something's got to get to the Amazon warehouse, you know, um, what Amazon's really mastering, I guess, is the, uh, you know, I'm going to send you this, this, uh, widget, you know, to your house and I'll have it there in a day. Um, 
but how does Amazon have a warehouse full of this stuff? That's still probably the over the road trucking piece. Do you think they'll so, try and vertically integrate and, well, and come into your market? It, it'd be interesting. They're starting to, um, but there's been a history of companies vertically integrating in the past. And a lot of it used to be commonplace where a lot of trucking companies had private or a lot of uh, shippers had private fleets. So, um, you know, you would have a, a, a company that would maintain stores like brick and mortar shopping stores, and they'd have their own fleet of trucks to service those stores like Sears and JC Penney's. Yeah. Or tar- Target. You okay. see a Target truck sure. or, or you would see, um, you know, Home Depot might, might have their own trucks. Coca-Cola might have their own Walmart, trucks, yeah. Walmart, that sort of thing. Um, Walmart still has a, a pretty large private fleet, but so many of those private fleets have gone away. They've outsourced it. They, they say, we don't want to be in the trucking business. You know, come to think of it, that actually was the selling point of natural gas. When they were, when they were going around telling everybody that they were going to do this, it was oh, really? the Target <laughs> fleet is going to do it or the Walmart fleet. I, I, if I recall the marketing correctly, that was oh, like really? a big way to, because, hmm. and it's probably because I didn't have any, uh, otherwise a regular person like me would have no idea that a person like you exists in these sure. trucking companies. But anyway, go on. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so many of these companies are like, you know, we don't want to be in the trucking business. You know, we, we, we make clothing, we make, uh, you know, we sell food products. I don't want to be, I don't want to be dealing with insurance. I don't want to be buying trucks, financing trucks, maintaining trucks, hiring mechanics, networking with, or contacting repair shop vendors. I don't want to be hiring drivers, managing drivers. Um, this is something that, that it just d- doesn't make sense for us to, to do. And I don't want to do it anymore. It's kind of what it boiled down to. And, um, and not to mention another reason that the private, uh, the private fleet model just wasn't, wasn't as successful is because, um, you know, we, we talked about the lane balances. I need to have X number of loads going in to get the truck out. Well, I mean, if you have a private fleet, you're, you're delivering all of your product. Well, unless you were just, you, you nailed it with your network of where your stores are and where your product's going and what your you're truck's going to be one on. way, not the other. You're going, yeah, you got to get back somehow. And you either drive back empty, and that's like uh, that's a hard pill to swallow, a lot of cost and a lot of waste, or you're gonna you're gonna be trying to find a, another customer's load, um, or another another shipper's load sure. that that can be brokered to you, and you will you will uh, agree to to bring that load back to subsidize the cost essentially, and that becomes a, a logistical monster, you know, to be able to to manage that. And again, it just kind of, they ended up throwing their hands up and saying, I don't want this. And that was actually something that our company did uh, a couple of years ago was we were finding people who wanted out of their private fleets and we rolled them in to a customer dedicated fleet. So we will buy your trucks, we'll buy your trailers, um, take on all your drivers and uh, we will guarantee you capacity. So we will maintain these 30 trucks, we'll manage the drivers, we'll, we'll rehire them if someone has to quit. And, um, you know, they're at your disposal. So you, you give us a fixed fee and we will move freight however and whenever you want with your 30 trucks and we'll just manage it for you. Sounds like a pretty clever, uh, yeah. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah. No, it did work. It did work. Um, and I mean, there, there's, a uh, a, a few companies that we did it with and, uh, yeah, it ended up, it ended up working. Um, okay. Last question. Yeah. What is the most interesting cargo that uh, that you think you can think of that you've uh, moved? Our our cargo is kind of kind of boring. Um, you know, I I mean, like like I said, we're we're doing a bunch of food products. I mean, we'll we'll haul beer and stuff like that. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of frozen foods. Now, I think some people get like into like pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. That gets pretty interesting when you're talking about. Um, cargo theft and and stuff like that, and cargo security, but it's not a not an area we've really kind of done a whole lot with. Um, I I will say instead of saying like the a specific type of product, um, just know this: we we haul uh, like ice cream, for instance, a lot of ice cream that is set the set point on the refrigeration unit is minus twenty degrees, and and it it maintains it. I mean, it's not just like blow off numbers. I mean, we will program that refrigeration unit to pump out minus 20 degree air and there's a return sensor on there and it's minus 20 degrees coming back to us. So those, those rectangular cubes attached to the trailer are are pretty amazing actually in terms of how cold it can get in there. And I remember like just the other day, uh, we had, uh, there's this thing in the industry called OS and D where 
uh, it's uh, overage, shortage, or damage. So if uh, our driver goes to deliver product and they say, hey, there were supposed to be uh, 40 pallets on this truck and there's 41, we don't want this extra pallet. Um, sometimes it's kind of different, but sometimes they say, oh, dispose of it or take it to this location. And uh, when that happens, we need to get in the trailer. The trailer's dropped at our yard and we facilitate doing you know something with it. And we had uh, frozen ice cream on there or just like gelato or something. And uh, they're like, yeah, dispose of this product. It's set at minus 20 degrees. And I was like, okay, well, let's get that product off of there because that's a lot of fuel to be, you know, cooling down that unit. So I was like, let me go in there. And I, I just am curious. I want to, because very, very rarely do I get to see the inside of a trailer because, I mean, they're, they're locked on it. They have these clips on it for cargo security reasons. So you never break the seal of a trailer that's being loaded. So um, because this is an OSD, I was like, yeah, I'm going to look inside. And I, I open up that trailer door minus 20 degrees. And I'm telling you, it was like frostbite. I mean, you'd be amazed at how cold it gets. It was like a winter storm in there. Um, <laughs> just like hitting you in the face. I mean, there's not like ice crystals or anything like that, but just in terms of like cold air and like, it's like chem light insul- insul- or, uh, insulation on the side and like these aluminum floors. I mean, it gets cold in there. So uh, again, you, something you wouldn't think of. Yeah. You're driving I mean, down the road at 75 miles an hour and it's a uh, hundred yeah. degrees outside and you look over and you're looking at minus 20 degrees. Yeah. It could be a minus 20 degree ice cream. I mean, you know, I guess they do it just to make it hard as a rock, you know, um, that, you know, you don't want to be like, Oh, it's, call it 20 degrees and it's frozen. You know, I think, I think for like quality purposes, you just, you want to like get it so, so cold. So the customer, when they say minus 20, we say, okay. And we set it to minus 20 and, uh, and roll. Yeah. Well, this has been a very enjoyable conversation. I am so glad you were willing to come over here, uh, so early in the morning, uh, to, to do this. So thank you so much. If people wanted to get a hold of you, you're on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on Twitter at, uh, Camden dot Savello and, uh, it's C A M D E N period C I V E L L O. So yeah, feel free to reach okay. out. I'll throw it in the show notes. Maybe, okay. uh, somebody looking for a new job opportunity or wants to hear about logistics. We're always hiring. Right. <laughs> well, thank you so yeah. much for coming by. All right. Appreciate thanks man. It. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's interview. I want to thank Camden Civello for stopping by the podcast so, so early in the morning. The other people I wanted to thank this week are you. My podcast has continued to grow with leaps and bounds. People are obviously sharing this with their friends and posting it out on social media, and I am so deeply grateful. I love doing these interviews, um, and it makes it gratifying and all that much more worthwhile when I see that people are putting it out in the world and sharing it uh, with others. There are two people people that I wanted to mention in particular. There's one, an Irishman named um, Buck Mulligan, and he goes by at that Buck guy on Twitter. And Buck and I have known each other since I worked at Monsanto. He was one of the three League of Nerds, and uh, they did one of the first interviews that anyone ever did with me when I was working for Monsanto. And to put that in context, at the time, almost no Fortune 500 companies were doing podcast interviews at all. And uh, Buck, Miles, and James uh, reached out to me and and asked me if I wanted to do an interview, and that really kicked off a whole part of my career. And I've always been grateful to those guys uh, for for getting me into the podcasting world. And Buck and I have uh, maintained a friendship and continue to talk. And one of the things that I find really interesting about him is he's always putting out ideas that range everything from stoicism to libertarianism. And he's got all these interesting perspectives on Brexit because he um, he's an Irishman. He lives out in Ireland. I believe uh, Ireland, maybe Northern Ireland. I I never can remember quite, but uh, I always enjoy talking with him. And I think that if you're looking for somebody interesting to follow on Twitter, that'll give you interesting ideas that you haven't heard before. I highly recommend you follow at that buck guy. Um, on Twitter. He's totally worth it. The other person I wanted to mention is a woman that I have met in person, and her name is Hannah Morgan Miller, and she goes by at Hannah Mo Miller on Twitter and uh, and Instagram. I, I think that she is one of the most refreshing and exciting people that I ever encounter on social media. She has an incredible knack for creating communities and getting those communities uh, to share ideas with one another, to, to get them to talk about what's hard, what's difficult and then to go on and talk about what what they're doing well and I think it's a rare person that is so good at being able to enrich a community make that community better and have all the ships rise up and um, uh, Hannah and I uh, speak on the phone every once in a while probably not often enough but whenever I do I come away 
uh, invigorated with a person that says, I'm going to think about social media strategy differently. I'm going to think about branding and marketing differently. And if you're looking for a person that uh, is um, just always driving forward with new strategic social media ideas, definitely follow Hannah Mo Miller on Twitter and reach out to her. If you've got uh, questions about how should I be running my social media, how do I do these in large scale campaigns, you could not possibly do better than her. So anyway, I want to thank uh, both Buck and Hannah and I uh, hope they're both doing well and thank you for listening I want to um, just uh, say if you if you keep giving me those reviews and comments they really help me out and next week I have no idea who I'll be interviewing I have gotten a lot of great recommendations there have been uh, people have really started to open up and say hey I know this really interesting person I'd like you to meet them too um, and now it's just a question of scheduling them all there's everything's from um, people involved in the chess world uh, to art and music and uh, and out in firefighting, all different sorts of domains. So I'm just going to keep it coming. And if you have any suggestions, don't hesitate to uh, find me on Twitter at Vance Crow or to visit my website, VanceCrow.com. So thank you so much for all of your time and attention. And we'll be back next Wednesday with another great interview.